Hello, my name is Frank Apache. I'm a licensed clinical social worker from the Big Island of Hawaii. I'm currently working at Hawaii Island Recovery as their clinical lead. I've been working for the last 10 years with the Greenwell Conservancy, which is a nonprofit on the Big Island that has raised money for the training of EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. And I'd like to share a little bit today about EMDR. Specifically, of course, as most of us know, it's used in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. But what is less known is that EMDR is also used in the treatment of addiction, as well as other compulsive behaviors. Um, EMDR, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing, originally um, formed and, uh, and, and discovered by Francine Shapiro um, to alleviate uh, the, the stress related with PTSD, with uh, chronic stress syndrome and other trauma related um, memory, memory phenomena. EMDR uses bilateral stimulation. What is that? The therapist will move their fingers, hands in front of the client's eyes. Their eyes will track back and forth or tapping alternately, butter tap, light taps, or sounds on both sides, clicking back and forth. And what this is believed to do is that these sounds allow the brain to go into a processing mode where memory is recontextualized, reprocessed. And it's believed that it's reprocessed from the context in which the memory was stored, the time, the experiences, the emotional intensity, and then it's reprocessed to the context here right now where we are at this moment and in so doing the memory is reorganized and more often than not loses its disturbance the idea that the brain cannot pull a memory into the here and now concentrate on a memory whether it's disturbing or not and also watch the fingers going back and forth can't do it it's kind of like trying to walk and chew gum, they say, at the same time. <laughs> it's now used, though, in addiction, and that's kind of what I want to share today. And when I first uh, was trained in EMDR, um, I had a chance to meet um, Jack Hipshire, who was the founder of Hawaii Island Recovery. And he really uh, joined up in a, in a strong commitment to bring EMDR and other best practices therapy here to Hawaii and to really make them available here in our community and to even support the training of, the, of best practice therapies. And I really kind of want to thank you. Thank Jack. He's gone now. He passed away a couple of years ago. But it, his legacy lives on in what we're doing at Hawaii on Recovery. And it lives on in the sharing of EMDR here in Hawaii. What we know about addiction is, is that there's a high prevalence of trauma. It's common belief to think that people turn to addiction to medicate um, the pain of traumatic memory or of the trigger responses, the flashbacks, the associations, uh, the compulsive reenactment behaviors that can occur when traumatic memory is re-stimulated in the present uh, substances are often used to medicate and mute those responses. Therefore, we believe that addressing trauma through EMDR and other means could potentially reduce the need for substances because it targets the painful memories um, and it reduces the distress associated with those memories. Why EMDR for addiction? Well, it helps reprocess the traumatic memories. We know that. Um, and it reduces their emotional charge and, and therefore the impact on behavior. There are many longitudinal controlled studies that demonstrate that EMDR treats post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a given now. That's a given. We know that it works. We're still wrestling on kind of how it works. You know, that, that's still up for debate. Um, but, but by addressing the root cause of trauma, EMDR can reduce the compulsion to, compulsion to use substances. The research shows it can be effective. We know that. And 
But we also are learning that EMDR can be used to treat addiction directly, the compulsive behavior. We can desensitize triggers and urge responses, craving behavior, and also reenactment behavior, triggered reenactment behavior. Um, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. We use EMD, eye movement desensitization, rather than necessarily going into the thought process or the cognitions related to the uh, the stimuli or the urge. We can, but, but EMD is a, a simplified way to approach it. We take a look at the craving. Craving, say, I don't know, alcohol, craving for alcohol or food or any, any really addictive or repetitive relationship. Um, and we, we measure that. We measure it on, on a 10-point scale, like the pain scale, 0 to 10, how much are we craving right now? And that measurement alone is the first intervention. The ability to measure a craving contains it to some extent because it, one, uh, it engages, as, uh, focalizes uh, areas of the brain that actually measure and quantify. In a way, it's a form of mindfulness uh, intervention from one perspective but it also is a containment in that it the, the the urge the craving is not zero to the nearest black hole in the in the universe it's zero to ten that's a containment right? once we have that then we begin to look at the what we call the secondary gains or even third tertiary gains but thinking about the secondary gains for example or alcohol we begin to identify them and list them okay so for some people that secondary gain is alcohol is considered for them a social behavior oh they need all their friends okay so then we say okay it's you get the benefit of a social a social experience what's that worth for you in other words how much do you are you holding on to your relationship with alcohol for the social benefit zero to ten and then we might say loua or level of urge to avoid losing that okay avoid the grief and the process of loss the anticipatory grief and we measure that on a zero to ten scale and we'll say that's an eight then we go on and say, what other are some of the other benefits that you know, the relationship with the uh, substance alcohol gives you? And it might, for some people, it might be managing their anxiety. For other people, it might be managing some form of pain or sensitivity. For, for others, it might be a mood change, a state change. There can be a wide range of reasons why people use any substance. And we take a measure of that attachment or what we call level of urge to avoid giving it up or that attachment and we bring that up notice where you feel it in the body and then we stay with it by using dual attention bilateral stimulation and what that does it heats up the bargaining process from one point of view it stimulates an internal struggle and very much like motivational interviewing we stay with it in a very non-judgmental and persuasive way. We allow the client, the patient, to wrestle with their own ambivalence. And we increase the ambivalence through the EMD, eye movement desensitization. So it both lowers over time and desensitizes the bargaining, uh, the ambivalence, um, but it also creates a situation where the individual can bargain it themselves and on their own terms. The therapist stays neutral. Okay? And this process lowers craving. And when we're done with the session, craving level of eight, we go back and it looks like a three or a four. So it can be used in that way. All right. And so that's one form of what they call detour, uh, detour or um, uh, desensitization of urge. Uh, uh, urge protocol. Uh, and so um, that's one area. There are other protocols with EMDR that process various aspects of the addictive uh, relationship. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of those today. That would be part of an EMDR training. But I, I wanted to kind of share really briefly 
kind of how it's used freestanding in addiction and to really get across the point that it's not just for PTSD. You know, a lot of times when people consider, you know, the team uh, in, in an inpatient setting talks about who is, you know, will benefit from EMDR. Uh, automatically, of course, we go PTSD. And if people say, well, they don't have PTSD, then they might say, well, but then they don't need EMDR. Not true. Not true at all. As a matter of fact, the EMDR might be a, a very direct way to get to treating the addictive process, um, especially for people who are experiential. They, they, they can, they're somatic and they can experience the process of the, uh, the reprocessing experience of EMDR. A, a slight aside is uh, dis, people with dissociation are, are often, we say that EMDR is not the primary first order of treatment for di structural dissociation phenomenon. And th that's true to a great extent and has been up until now. I would like to share that we have an innovation in EMDR now and a lot of good research to support this little thing we call EMDR 2.0 where there we have learned how to engage the avoidance phenomena of the dissociation in an adaptive way. And with that engagement of the dissociation through various different approaches, we can now process the traumatic memory even with dissociative individuals, which is quite a step forward in EMDR. I'd like to wrap this up with talking a little bit about this particular article from a Matt, uh, it's a Marco Pagini, Hogberg, Fernandez, and Sarah Cuso, no, I believe. It's Correlates of EMDR Therapy, Functional and Structural Neuroimaging. This particular article, I encourage people who are interested to look into it. There we've used EMDR and we've monitored with EEG, spec scan, MRI, the entire limbic system, doing brain scans during an EMDR session. And in here, we are observing definite changes and definite shifts in circulation, so to speak, between the limbic, the, the, the lower and midbrain uh, amygdala system and frontal cortex. And we're showing how the EMDR session, even within the session, the frontal cortex is stimulated, it lights up. And we know that when the frontal cortex lights up, we begin to have self-observer, we begin to have agency, and, and, and so important, internal locus of control, impulse control begins to be established. The other thing in this article, which is really quite profound, is that it, with very few EMDR sessions, a notable thickening of hippocampal volume has been observed. And this is groundbreaking. This is the first psychotherapy that has produced a measurable structural change in an adaptive way in the brain, the brain of grown adults. This is, this is a ground shaking kind of a breakthrough. Um, this particular research is being replicated now over a 10 year study, very large samples in Rome, uh, Italy right now. And they were probably in the sixth year of the study. So that study is looking at not only does, is it only EMDR that does this or do other therapies do, do other therapies do this like CBT or other therapies? And they're looking at different therapies under different conditions to see if this, these findings will be replicated and under different conditions. So I'd like to uh, open this up um, uh, to uh, uh, a, uh, a, a, uh, bit of Q&A. You hear some of the findings. You'll see that in your printout of the um, uh, of this uh, PowerPoint, some of the findings that are there. And so I'd like to uh, open this up now for Q&A and I appreciate this opportunity to share a bit about EMDR. And I kind of want to also shout out a thanks to Jack Kibshire, wherever you are. He passed away a few years ago. And thank him for the fact that we're still bringing this innovative Renaissance therapy to Hawaii and certainly through Hawaii Island Recovery. Thank you.